Hi there and welcome to another edition of the Geology 101 video series. I'm Geology Professor Sean Wilsey. This is episode 8, a second part to our uh, previous episode on minerals. So this is a part 2 follow-up to looking at minerals. Uh, if you're new to Geology 101, this is a video series for anyone that's new to geology, maybe had a class years ago and you're looking for a refresher um, for whatever reason and for whatever um, path you've come to us then thanks for being here uh, this is modeled after the same curriculum and content I use for my geology 101 class here at the college so let's go ahead and jump into this episode we spent last episode our part one of minerals looking at what makes up a mineral and then looking at properties of minerals characteristics of minerals f physical properties that properties that we often use to test minerals and to identify minerals um, you should follow these two series up possibly with looking at my minerals with Wilsey series where you get a look at minerals in a little bit more detail that'll help you be able to identify some of the most common minerals but I wanted to follow up our last video with just a few more interesting things about minerals and this will pave the way pretty nicely for our next video where we jump into our first group of rock the igneous rock so this will pave the way nicely into understanding how to look at and classify and understand igneous rocks in a lot more detail so please recognize that there's a lot of minerals out there. There's a lot of different elements that can combine in solid form on earth in nature in an inorganic uh, manner with a specific chemical composition and an internal structure. That's the definition of a mineral. So there's lots of minerals out there, uh, 5,000. Um, but you really don't need a whole lot of know-how to navigate most of the minerals you see. There's really just a few that are really common and so the nice thing is is it doesn't take too much learning to be able to handle identifying a lot of minerals and a lot of rocks there's no way i know all 5000 i probably know well i don't know maybe like 50 or 60 minerals to be quite honest um, but that will get you by through a lot of different um, rocks and occurrences of rock and minerals that you see on planet earth so most of these minerals are made of different combinations of these eight elements so oxygen silicon aluminum magnesium iron potassium calcium and sodium if you take these eight elements mix them together in various ways to form minerals uh, most of the minerals we see on planet earth are combinations of these elements so we're not going to get too deep into the chemistry uh, there's other avenues that you might choose to for that um, but just recognize that most of the minerals we're going to look at have combinations of these common elements on planet earth and so let's look at first what a native element is. This would be a mineral, something that qualifies and matches the definition of a mineral. But we call it, innate, we call it a native element because it consists of only one single element. So for example, we have gold here. And that was one of our quiz questions from part one, the last video we well, worked on this together with. So there's gold. Uh, this is a diamond over here on the right. So diamond, of course, is made out of carbon, and that's all it's made out of. Diamond is nothing more than pure carbon uh, in a very high temperature, high pressure uh, environment in which it crystallizes and forms a specific mineral and we call that mineral diamond but diamond is also considered a native element and then here's an example here sulfur sulfur is uh, also a native element so these would be elements that exist in nature but because they exist in nature in solid forms not combined with other elements they and they have all the other characteristics we talked about for a mineral they are considered minerals but they're also considered what we call native elements so just a fun little uh, little side note there. So let's look at specifically uh, some different groups of minerals. These are going to be some of the more important minerals that we'll see moving forward as we get into the igneous rocks. And again, this supplements nicely with the minerals with Wilsey series. So it turns out that the two most abundant elements on Earth that have a very strong bond when they uh, come together are silicon and oxygen. And when those two come together, we call it this material here. It's called silica. And silica has this basic chemical uh, formula here, SiO4. It makes up a lot of the material that we find in the crust and the mantle. And so as humans, we're up here on the surface of the earth. Most of the rocks you're going to see, if not all the rocks you're going to see, are rocks from the earth's crust. And occasionally we see deeper rocks brought to the surface through various processes, rocks from the earth's mantle. So knowing a, two, a thing about silica and silica-based minerals is incredibly valuable to understanding um, this this little concept here. So it turns out that the silica is bonded in this matter. So you have one 
um, atom of silicon and then we've got four oxygen atoms bonded to it so it forms this shape here called a tetrahedron and we're not going to dig into the, the weeds too much here again this is geology 101 but it turns out that there's lots of different ways that these tetrahedra can bond to others and form very complex uh, systems of um, bonds in here so you can see some of the options here and again we're not going to get into this level of detail I just wanted to show you a quick graphic here uh, if you take a mineralogy class or crystallography class you'll get a bit of a deeper dive into this so um, okay so what does that mean well it turns out that there's a lot of silicate minerals but as we transition more into the igneous rocks there are really two groups of four that are going to be very important so if you can really get a handle on these eight minerals that's going to really set you up nicely for not just the igneous rocks but uh, a lot of the metamorphic rocks as well you see these a little less in some sedimentary rocks but they're, again they're common enough in the earth's crust that it's an important set of minerals to understand so there's a group called the mafic silicates so the mafic silicates are silicate minerals they contain silicon and oxygen but they have a few other ingredients as well they have either a little bit of iron or a little bit of magnesium and they tend to be quite dark in color so because of the elements they contain they are fairly dark in color so here we have one called olivine which is this typical kind of olive green color this one here is peroxine or sometimes called augite this one here is amphibole <coughs> excuse me sometimes called hornblende and this is biotite or biotite mica uh, as you can see they're quite dark in color then there's another group of silicate minerals that contain different elements so they do not contain iron or magnesium and instead the other elements that are combined with silicon and oxygen would be aluminum potassium sodium or calcium and these tend to be quite light in color so you can see it's a little hard to tell with this first one here it probably looks dark to you but this is actually transparent and sometimes colorless if you get it in thin sheets this is muscovite mica uh, here's another one here in the top right this is plagioclase feldspar here's a similar feldspar the potassium feldspars and then here's quartz here so you can see that they're generally kind of light in color so felsic silicates and mafic silicates these are two good terms to add to your lexicon because again as we get into igneous rocks and even when we start talking about volcanoes these terms are going to be helpful some volcanoes have have dominantly mafic magmas and so when those magmas cool and crystallize they dominantly contain mafic silicate so you can tell a lot about rocks by looking at their composition of mafic and or felsic silicate minerals again mafic generally dark in color felsic generally pretty light in color there's other groups of minerals of course as well not just the silicate so there's uh, the sulfides and here's a few examples you might have heard of galena and pyrite here's a nice example of galena which is iron sulfide galena tends to be very heavy and dense um, it has this beautiful cubic cleavage planes uh, so it breaks into cubes and it's very metallic and, and shiny there are groups called the oxides that contain oxygen as their basic um, core constituent or element so hematite magnetite a mineral called corundum which in gem form is often called ruby then there's the sulfates uh, which contain sort of a combination of sulfur and oxygen this is what we call sulfate and then that would be something like gypsum there's the phosphates which contain phosphorus and oxygen so something like quartzite or excuse me turquoise would be an example of that and then finally the carbonates which contain uh, co3 carbonate carbon and oxygen these minerals are set apart because these are one of the minerals remember i showed you one last time with the physical properties it was a mineral that fizzes with the acid it bubbles and reacts to the acid gives off uh, co2 that would be the carbonate minerals so calcite is probably our most important one but there's some others here as well that are important so reckon and this is by no means an all-inclusive list there's a lot more than these as well but this just gives you a little bit of taste for the other groups of minerals that exist out there um, and then finally to wrap up this short episode here let's look at a few different processes so how do minerals actually form what's the process whereby minerals uh, come to exist well one way is when we have uh, water with dissolved mineral material in that water and then if something happens to that water that drives that dissolved material into solid form we call that precipitation that would be an example of pre precipitation from solution so in a cave you've maybe seen something like this where the water is dripping from the ceiling of the cave and it forms these 
uh, long slender or icicle shaped stalactites and so these are actually formed these are mineral deposits formed by that process um, they're carrying dissolved in this case calcite and that calcite is precipitated or left behind as a solid mineral form uh, carried by the water. Another example might be evaporation. Here's the Tufa Towers at Mono Lake in California. And so water can also carry mineral material. And then when the water evaporates, that concentrates the mineral material left behind. And so you can get concentration of those minerals in, in, in by evaporation. Salt would be another example of that same kind of thing. You might get the cooling and crystallization of magma. That really encapsulates what our next video is going to be on with igneous rocks. So when magma uh, starts to cool, the elements start to bond together, forming small crystals uh, that can grow over time. And those crystals then are minerals. And so that's one way in which minerals form. We might see metamorphism, which again will be the subject of a future episode where we have existing minerals that are actually changed, not melted, but changed in their solid state form into new types of minerals. Uh, and so metamorphism would be an example that we can generate minerals. Uh, and then finally here, uh, kind of a variation on the first theme there, I suppose, hydrothermal or hot or warm water solutions. So when you get hot water moving through rock, it can dissolve more material. Think of maybe uh, if you like your coffee very sugary, if you like it very sweet, you might already know that the hotter you get your coffee, the more sugar you can dissolve in the coffee. If the coffee is at a lower temperature, it's hard to get that sugar to dissolve. It kind of sits there on the bottom of the cup. And the same is true in the earth. If we have very hot water, it's able to dissolve more mineral material, carry that in solution, and then at some point, if the conditions change, it can precipitate that mineral material out. So in this case, we have a nice quartz vein uh, cutting through the rocks right there. So these are just some ways in which minerals form. So this kind of wraps up our, our two-part episodes on minerals. What we'll do with our next episode, and I guess episode nine, is we'll start getting into the igneous rocks. And we'll start looking at our first group of rocks, how we classify them, how they form, why they're different, and that'll segue nicely into a discussion in a future episode about volcanoes, one of my favorite topics. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks for your support. Hope this was helpful. Oh, wait, we have a quiz question. I almost forgot. Let's get to the quiz question. So here we go. So here we have six different uh, minerals, also uh, minerals. And so some of these are native elements. And so which one of these six is not a native element okay so think of the definition of a native element what we went over there i'll give you a few seconds to think that through you might want to pause the video if you need a little bit more time and then let's work through this together so remember a native element is a mineral it's also called a native element and it's called that because it exists in nature matches all the criteria of a mineral but it's just one single element so copper do we see copper in nature we do there's a type of copper called native copper it's not combined with any other element it exists by itself in solid form so copper is a native element how about diamond well I showed you that is one of the examples diamond is made out of pure carbon so car diamond is a native element Sulfur was another one I showed you. Sulfur is also a native element. What about graphite? This might be a different substance you haven't heard of. Uh, graphite is what we see when we use pencils. It's essentially pencil lead. It's an unfortunate name because it's, you know, it, nowadays we it doesn't contain any lead. Graphite is actually the same as diamond. It's made out of pure carbon. It's a low temperature and low pressure form of carbon. So graphite does meet the definition of a native element, as does silver. We can sometimes find silver, native silver in veins or in other uh, ore deposits. How about iron? Well, iron, it turns out, although being quite common, and very prolific in Earth's rocks. Turns out iron always needs a buddy. Iron does not exist in nature by itself. It's always tied to oxygen or sulfur or some other element. So for that reason, because we have not found iron by itself in nature on planet Earth, it is not a native element. So that was the correct answer E there. So hope that was helpful. You like the little quizzes at the end. Those are fun to put together. Just assess your learning. Again, thank you for your time. Thanks for joining me for this episode and take care.